Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today, I'd like to talk about designing our energy future. Now, the last several years, we actually seen greenhouse gas, re greenhouse gas reductions in the US drop due to the availability of natural gas, so much so that they've started to call natural gas a bridging fuel to our clean energy future. And that's good, but it's really the near end of the bridge. A fossil fuel isn't really going to get us to the middle or far end of the bridge, particularly with the amount of greenhouse gas reductions that we're talking about. So right now, what we really have is a peer to the future. And so what I'm going to talk about today is what the middle and far end of that bridge might look like and what it'll take to get there. Now, when we talk about building a bridge, we also have to talk about where we want to go. And uh, in talking about sustainable energy, what we want to go is a lot of places. And how you normally hear about this is in the context of climate change, and in particular, greenhouse gas mitigation or reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But if you've read the literature, you'll see that there's a lot more to it than that, namely adaptation to climate change. Now even that, if you take mitigation and adaptation together, there's still a lot left to the solution space for a sustainable energy future. And that's because there's lots of things, environmental impacts, impacts of population growth and feeding 9 billion people come mid-century, and land use and clean water, and even my favorite topics, growing and aging infrastructures, that we have to address. And so we think about a sustainable energy future, it's really trying to address all of these together. And so while globalization of economies and climate change act globally, they impact locally. And so local solutions to global problems and designing for that are one of the key challenges that we have. Now, how did I come to this space? Well, 30 years ago, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in West Africa designing wood conserving cookstoves. Back then in the early 80s, we weren't worrying about climate change yet. We were worrying about deforestation and how that impacted the, the biodiversity and the, uh, the forests around villages and towns in Benin, where I was a volunteer. But to get to have an impact on deforestation, the best way to do it was to design wood-conserving cookstoves that saved poor families money. And so it was the design issue back then from a fairly not, not high-tech uh, technology, but thinking about the design context, how that scales up and impacts everything around it. Well, since then, I've been working on how to provide better energy resources around the world, doing regional energy planning, and how all these technologies fit together and evolve out our energy infrastructures through time. And we've done work across the world, a lot of stuff here in the US, a fair amount of stuff in Europe, China, and, uh, and also the Middle East. And we've had a lot of fun, because it's, it's design, it's inventive. And we've got to remember, design is fun. All right? Take the example of Minecraft, right? How, how many of you or your children, don't be shy, uh, have taken a crack at Minecraft? Well, what's fun about it? Are they playing the game or are they building new environments? Well, it didn't take long for the Minecraft folks to actually see that there was a real world application to that, and they teamed up with the UN in the Block by Block program to essentially use Minecraft with local communities in India. Kenya, Peru, Haiti, and elsewhere to design public parks and public spaces. So now you see the blurring of the lines between design and gaming, between looking at things on computers and figuring out how to do it in the real world. In fact, what's happened earlier this year is the governments of Denmark and the UK have taken their GIS database and their geotechnical database and now offer a complete Minecraft map of the country. So these things are getting easier and more creative, and the barriers are lowering in how to do design in general. Well, let's bring it back to designing sustainable energy systems. This is a big problem, big challenges, lots of stuff going on. And one of the things I've learned in our projects around the world is you really can't generalize. There's no one-size-fits-all solution if you're looking at an at a Portuguese island in the mid-Atlantic, 
or a, or a province in China of 200, 200 million people. And so there's no one-size-all solutions, no one-size-fits-all solutions. In fact, in a one-size-fits-all world, everybody kind of dresses funny. <laughs> but while everybody is unique or every place is unique, they're sort of unique in familiar ways. And so as we've done this over the years, we've seen that technology sort of applied the same. Not exactly, but you can get a, a, a heads up on this. And so as we look at different places around the world, essentially we can pull out three main themes of what a sustainable energy strategy or what a sustainable energy infrastructure will look like once you get the middle or far end of that bridge. And energy efficiency, aggressive energy efficiency is the first one. And there's, when you say energy efficiency, usually people hear more efficient devices. How efficient is it when it's on? And, and, and LED light bulbs and other light bulbs and Energy Star air conditioners or refrigerators, refrigerators are a good example of that. And it's very, very important. What we've been seeing over the last several years, and it's really coming to force, is energy utilization efficiency. And this is the efficiency of turning things off. And you've all probably seen or heard examples of this, like a hybrid car. One of the reasons why it's more efficient, well, you're at a red light, the engine turns off. You're not moving, why is the engine on? You're not moving forward. Same thing is increasingly true with your house, with smart thermostats. Now, obviously, your computer already goes into sleep mode uh, when you're not using it too long. So those are really powerful tools. And what you see, particularly in this energy utilization efficiency, is we're substituting energy with information. And it's a big, big dynamic. So that's the first one. The second one is diversify domestically. Get more of your energy resources from close to you. Stop importing fossil fuels from far, far away. And renewable energy is increasingly part of this mix, again, in the middle or far end of the, of the, uh, the bridge. So what's your local mix? And if you're trying to really, really knock out fossil fuels, then you're going to look to get most of your, your energy close to home. How sunny is it? How windy is it? Do you have hydropower? Do you have ge geothermal? Do you have waste energy? How do all these fit together? Do you have too little at some times of year and too much at the other time of year? How do you bridge that gap? And that's where the third one comes in, modernizing energy networks. And here I'm using the example of the smart grid. So if everybody's house is turning itself on and off and, and the renewable energy is going up and down because a cloud went over your PV panel or the weather front moved through on the wind, then essentially the grid has to handle all those balances. And if it includes energy storage, well, then it needs to know how much for how long. So there we have information in the design as well as information in the operation of a sustainable energy system. And then, well... What is a smart grid? Or better question yet is, how smart does my grid need to be? So that's another design question. Maybe I don't need a genius grid. Maybe a not dumb grid will do. <laughs> so these are the kind of things we work, work on, and we have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, now, there are some challenges. We're not saying this is easy. And so one of the things that's usually claimed for renewables is, well, they're intermittent. Okay, And that's true. But that doesn't mean they're unpredictable. In fact, the more wind and solar you have, the more predictable it's going to be over time. And there's some trade-offs there, too. So one of the things that I really like about solar and wind is that there's two things I don't need. I don't need a fuel supply infrastructure, and I don't need cooling water. And those are two, two, big, two big investments that I can get away with, that I can avoid. And I can also get away with a lot of solid waste and other things on the back end of the power plants as well. So in some respects, the trade-off becomes, is it pipes versus wires? Because if I have a wind farm, I'm still going to need to bring that power to your house and to your city. And increasingly, it's pipes versus wires versus Wi-Fi. And so that's, that's the, the real trick. And thinking now that all energy is local. Now let me give you a very, very quick example of this. Here's the solar map of the United States. Hides a lot. It's for photovoltaics because, well, the seasons are different. So if I look at it from month to month, you see it tells a very, very different story. 
And that's obviously going to affect the design of my system to make sure I have enough energy at different times of year and different times of day. Because we know that the sun goes down every night, so half of the day and therefore half of the year, the, the, the resource looks like this, right? And we can do the same thing with wind. There's much more microclimate associated with this. And so we need the, the detail to figure out where wind fits in. And wind is more related to the storms coming through than it is the sun coming up and going down. So putting this all together, there's a couple other things I want you to think about. And one is, is, not, is when we design future energy systems, we have a positive discussion about designing for the future. Okay? And to do that, we need, to do we need high resolution data to get things going. We need designers, okay, Minecraft, Lego. So we have kids of all ages at MIT putting little blocks together to, to, to do so prototyping of neighborhoods and things. This nice image that I have behind here showing the, where people are using electricity at night, we put together with Google Earth with data from NASA. And then SketchUp is another tool. But living in the future is where we want to get back to. Too many people live in the present, particularly if they're poor and need to know where their me next meal is coming from. Some people, uh, uh, due to accidents of history, are mired in the past. But if we can have a positive discussion about where we want to be in 10, 20, 30 years, then that puts it all together in a sense that we can have a collective decision of where we want to go. So generally, we say, think globally and act locally. But, as I've just shown you, we need to think locally as well. So this distills down to think and act, or better yet, design and implement together. And let's go build some bridges. Thank you very much.